Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, cause Jesus is the way. Today we're going to be talking about a whole list of subjects. The somatic symptom disorders, eating, elimination, sleep disorders, impulse and conduct disorders. And it's going to get very interesting because especially the first ones we're talking about are going to really challenge us in the whole area of spec. Remember, are they spiritual? Are they physical? Are they something that's going on in the person's experiences, or are they something going on in their choices? And we're going to have to really get into that. Now, the first group we're going to be talking about are somatic symptom and related disorders. Now, what does somatic mean? Somatic means bodily. So what are we going to say? In this particular group, the issue is that is going to have to do with bodily symptoms that are going on in the person. Now, does that mean that these are just all physical things that only doctors deal with? And the answer is no. If we want to go back, how many of you have ever heard of Rene Descartes? Well, he is the guy who came up with what they call body-mind dualism. He said the body and the mind were separate. Well, guess what we found out since then? This isn't true at all. In fact, as we get into these somatic symptom disorders, we're going to find out that many times they're caused by a psychological problem. Now, in the past, the way these things were handled was really problematical, and that's why it's been changed. It used to be, if somebody comes in with a problem and the doctors run all the tests they can run on the situation, and they can't find any reason that the person has these symptoms, they send them to you. And that was sort of the criteria, and they've changed that now and made it more specific, so you have to have certain criteria, so it just isn't, well, if we can't find any physical reason wrong with it, then it must be psychological. That's not good enough criteria to make any of these diagnoses that we're talking about today. So the first one is called a somatic symptom and related disorder. Multiple unexplained symptoms. Now in DSM-4, this was very interesting because they had all these different areas. Like there was one type we call a somatoform disorder, and it had to have five different problems and five different symptoms to, uh, to give this particular disorder. We're not doing that anymore. We're just saying this is a whole area, and we're looking at the areas, not these discrete particular areas that we're looking at. What are the requirements? One or more somatic, remember that's body, symptoms that are distressing and the result of a significant disruption in daily life. Excessive thoughts, feelings, or behaviors about the seriousness of the symptoms manifest in at least one of the following. This isn't good enough just to have the symptoms. You also have to have the distress concerning the symptoms. Disproportionate or persistent thoughts about the seriousness of the symptoms. Words, the way you look at it is much bigger than what the situation really is based on the symptoms. Persistently high level of anxiety about health and symptoms. Excessive time or energy devoted to these symptoms or the health concerns. The symptoms are persistent, although anyone may not be continuously present. Specifiers. Predominant pain or persistent, that means more than six months. Mild means you have two symptoms. Moderate, two or more. Severe, a moderate, two or more of the symptoms above. Severe, two or more symptoms and multiple somatic complaints. So what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? What kind of situations do we see quite a bit in the somatic symptoms? How about somebody that is struggling and they always think they're sick and they're always going to the doctor over and over and over again? And of course, your question is what? Well, 
Are they really sick or are they just making up things as you go along? And that's why this gets very confusing. How are you going to deal with this? Well, hopefully you're going to try and figure out what the real situation is and what is causing these particular things to happen. The next we have is called illness anxiety disorder. Now understand that 75% of people that we used to call have hypochondria would fall under the somatic symptom disorder and the last 25% fall into the illness anxiety disorder. How are they different? Illness anxiety disorder, preoccupation with having or acquiring a serious illness. The somatic symptoms are not present or they're mild. Remember, what was the main criteria of the first one? The somatic symptoms. This one, you don't have those symptoms. They're just afraid they're going to get sick or they're afraid there's something wrong with them. So they're going to the doctor, but they don't have the physical symptoms that go along with this. Preoccupation is clearly excessive or disproportionate. Individuals easily alarmed about health issues performs excessive health-related activities. Some of these people might actually even go through surgery. Present for six months, not another mental disorder. They do a lot of care-seeking or care-avoidant behavior, and those are specifiers. Whether the person is actually seeking care or they're trying to avoid care for these particular things. So a lot of those, we don't know if the symptoms are made up or not, right? But how about another category that has been called in the past a conversion disorder? And that means that you have the symptoms, but the symptoms are not based on actually medical problems. Now, how do they know? Let's look. One or more symptoms of altered voluntary motor or sensory function. Clinical findings are incompatible with recognized neurological or medical conditions. You no longer can have a conversion disorder based on guessing or no one can find anything. You have to be able to prove, as an example, they're hurting in certain places, but the nerves don't run that way. There are certain things that you can prove that what this person has is not physical. It's caused psychologically. And sometimes you see very interesting things. I had a particular guy who was working with a conversion disorder, and he would just freeze. All right, another person that had seizures. And how did we know that they weren't physical? Because this person actually had one right in the doctor's office. They put an electrocardiogram on him, and there were no seizure activity going on in the brain. Turned out in that particular case, it had more to do with spirits than it had to do with anything else. Trying to sort that out. Not another medical or mental condition. Clinically significant distress and impairment. And we have a lot of specifiers to make it clear what's going on here. With weakness or paralysis. With abnormal movement. Swallowing. Speech. Attacks of seizures. Amnesia or sensory loss, special sensory symptoms, mixed symptoms, acute episode, or a psychological stressor, or without psychological stressor. So you have all of these things, and they've all been pretty lumped together in sort of one category here, so you're going to have to be the one who gets to sort them out and to figure out how much of this is physical and how much of this is spiritual and how much of this is their experiences or their choices again. So what are you going to try and do here? First, establish a strong relationship with this person so they trust you. Do a full investigation, try and get a hold of what else is going on psychologically in their mind that could be going on to cause these kind of things. Find and deal with the underlying issue. Might be hard to get them to admit that this really isn't because many times they don't know. They don't think they're causing it. This isn't just somebody making something up. They actually have these symptoms, they just don't realize that they're psychologically based. Psychological factors affecting another medical condition, because these things go both ways. We can have the psychological factors affecting here, or the medical condition affecting the psychological factor. 
medical symptom is present. Psychological or behavior factors adversely affect the condition in one or more of the following. They exasperate or delay recovery, they interfere with treatment, additional well-established health risk, interfere with underlying psychopathology, precipitating or exasperating symptoms, or necessitating medical conditions. When are you going to get that one mostly? The doctor is trying to treat this person and all sorts of things aren't working like they should be and they think there's a psychological underlying factor here that's causing the problem. Next we have a factitious disorder. Now how is a factitious disorder different? Well, it's imposed on self and the person actually knows they don't have these symptoms. What are they doing? They're trying to convince you or convince the doctor that they have these symptoms for different reasons. Falsification of physical or psychological signs or symptoms or induced induction of injury or disease associated with identifying deception. Individual presents self as ill, impaired, or injured. What would be one of these cases? Remember some of the ones that we hear on TV or something that somebody that they were sick and they were dying of cancer and they raised all sorts of money on the internet? That's a factitious disorder. Deceptive behavior is evident even in the absence of obvious external rewards. Not another medical disorder such as delusional disorder or a psychotic disorder. But it can also be imposed on another. Remember some of the cases where it was the mom that was saying that the kid had this problem, but the kid never had that problem? Well, these are the difference here is that these people know that they're doing it. The other people, it's psychologically affecting them. They really have the symptoms and they're really concerned about them. But these people really know. Specifier, single episode, reoccurring episode. There are other things, though, you can think about. My daughter actually had a practicum at one particular point where she was working in a mental hospital for prisoners that were considered to be mentally ill. And they were trying to figure out how many of these were just making up these symptoms so they wouldn't be tried for whatever they did or how many of them were really having the problems and so on that they had and were really mentally ill. And of course, they were trying to get them well enough that they could stand trial. So it's very interesting. And one of the ladies there was very expert at figuring this particular thing out. Here are some things to think about. They describe their medical history dramatically, but vague when pressed for details. Extensive knowledge of medical terminology and routine. Many eagerly undergo painful tests or even surgery. If confronted, deny the charges and rapidly discharge themselves. There's even a chronic form of that. But if you look at their history, you can figure it out. Many times they received extensive medical treatment as children or they carry a grudge against the medical profession. They many times have worked as a nurse or a paraprofessional because they have all the information. Underlying dependency and personality traits. What are you looking for? What's the payoff? There's something here going on. What are they going to get out of this particular thing by having these situations? And it might not always be money. It could be just attention from the doctors. But the thing is, you've got to sort out. Is this person really know what's going on and be able to confront them and deal with it? Or is this a somatic symptom disorder and the person actually has these symptoms and they're caused by underlying factors and they're not knowingly causing any of this stuff to happen? They tend to choose new poorly investigated illnesses where the diagnosis is not very specific. Very difficult to manage and they're very disagreeable. Said so treatment is trying to find the payoff, gently confront them, help them find the need and meet that need. It's a man that I knew that was dealing with some court issues and so on and he was in a wheelchair. Well, the court analysis didn't go very well because the court officer that was evaluating him saw him get out of the wheelchair to go to the bathroom. 
So that didn't help too much. Other specific somatic symptom and related disorders. This is sort of a catch-all for all those other things that you really can't come up with. Brief somatic symptom disorder. That's less than six months. Brief illness anxiety disorder. Illness anxiety disorder without excessive health-related behaviors. There's even one where people believe they're pregnant when they're not. Ever hear of that one? Yes. Unspecified somatic symptom and related disorders. An assessment, again, how do you figure these things out? We're no longer allowed to just say, well, the doctor couldn't find anything here, so they must have this. What are some of the areas here that you run into a lot, and what are some of the terms that fit into these categories? Anyone here of chronic fatigue syndrome? Or how about fibromyalgia? See, those are the ones that you really can't tie down very well, and we don't have anything physical to really treat them in certain ways. There are certain medications that help, but that doesn't mean that they're making this stuff up, okay? They are really tired. I've dealt with clients with both of those, but they're very difficult to sort out and to find what's going on underneath and what's really happening. Etiology, poorly understood. Hysterical symptoms, which is one of those types of things, can be removed with hypnosis. That's one of the reasons we know that these things exist, is because if a person can go under hypnosis and the symptoms disappear, what does that tell us? They weren't physically caused, they were psychologically caused in some way, and the hypnosis actually changed the situation. Some people think that it's underlying emotional conflicts that are more tolerable than the physical symptoms. Primary or secondary gain in some way. Cognitive. Communicate the emotions that cannot otherwise be expressed. These are all theories that people have as why this works this way and there are theories from different psychological ways of looking at the situation. Suggestibility. Many times they have a close friend that has the illness. I had a particular lady that was dealing with this as well as panic attacks. And one time she went to the doctor and there was a lady sitting in the doctor's office and they got talking. And this lady was explaining to her that when she had her panic attacks, the entire side of her body went numb. Guess what happened to my client the next time she had a panic attack? The entire side of her body went numb. So somehow, psychologically, they just pick that up and those things actually happen. Was she trying to cause that? No, but the suggestibility has a factor here and causes problems. So what can you do? One is exposure and response to prevention like fears. You deal with, okay, there's some fear, there's something else going on here. We're going to have them face these particular things. We're going to have to deal with these particular things. Another one of the things that you sort of have to look for here is that sometimes, let's say a conversion disorder is blindness. But this blind person doesn't run into walls. Doesn't fall over things like other blind people do. So there's all those things you have to be looking at and saying, does this make sense? How do I sort these things out to know what is actually going on? And of course, you're going to get people like this referred to you by doctors who haven't found anything wrong with them that don't know what's going on, so they hope you're going to figure it out for them, right? The next area we're going to talk about is feeding and eating disorders. The first one is called pica, and that's usually young kids and so on are eating stuff that is not really food, it's not really nutritive. Eating non-nutritive, non-food substances for one month, inappropriate for the developmental level, not culturally supported or socially normative. There was actually one case where in this particular society, eating dirt was a good thing. Maybe they felt they got nutrients out of it. I'm not sure what the reason was, but that wouldn't fit this, would it? Because in their society, that's what they do. 
sufficiently severe to warrant clinical attention if associated with another mental disorder like intellectual disability, autism, or schizophrenia. See, the person's mind just might not be functioning right, but you've got to sort that out. Specifier in remission, not well understood. See, could it be the person's craving certain minerals? We don't know. Could it be autism? We don't know, but you've got to sort those out and you're looking for other reasons of why this is happening. Rumination disorder. Regurgitating and chewing food already eaten. Sometimes they spit it out, sometimes they swallow it again. Repeated regurgitation, re-chewing, re-swallowing, or spitting out the food. Not a gastrointestinal or other medical disorder. Not another eating disorder. Not associated with another mental disorder. But if it is, if it's clinically significant, you can still give this diagnosis. Can cause malnutrition. It can be self-soothing or self-stimulating in a certain way. Again, it's not very well understood. Avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. The difference here, we're going to get into anorexia in a little bit, but the difference here is the person just doesn't like certain flavors or certain textures or certain things. They just won't eat certain foods. Significant weight loss, nutritional deficiency, dependent on feeding or supplements, marked interference with functioning, not a lack of available food or culturally sanctioned practice, not anorexia or bulimia, body weight or shape is viewed as normal, not medical, or a mental condition. Specifier in remission. What's the question? What are the triggers? What is it this person doesn't like about this particular thing? I would look in the background and say, okay, was this person forced to eat spinach all their life? And so they don't want to eat spinach? What is the reason for this occurring? And you see, all these things, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out what are the reasons, why do we have these interesting physical things going on? All of you, I'm sure, have heard of anorexia nervosa. 90 to 95% of people with this are ladies. It's only about four-tenths of a percent in the population. But this is one you're going to find out when we deal with eating disorders that there is a whole control factor in this and they're very difficult to deal with. In fact, the reason that mostly these people are sent away for a 30-day treatment where you have a whole crew of different people working on this is because they can be that difficult. And of course, they can starve themselves to the point that they can die. Very difficult to work with. Restrictive energy intake leading to significant body weight. It's lower than the minimally expected development or health. Intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat or persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain, even though they're significantly of low weight. So if they don't have the fear, do you see we don't have anorexia? You can have somebody that's starving themselves for some other reason. Let's say they're going on a 40-day fast. But if they have the fear of gaining weight, then we're dealing with this. Disturbance in a way in which one's body weight or shape is experienced, undue influence of body weight or shape on self-evaluation, or persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of the current low body weight. They don't see themselves that way. There's actually a, a little method that they came up with. They have a mirror and they have the person watch themselves in the mirror and by turning the handle, they can warp the person's picture and ask them, now do you feel that this is healthy? Now do you feel that this is healthy? Guess what do you find out? They warp themselves to like a twig <laughs> and they still don't think it's thin enough. So there's something going on there. Specifiers, the restrictive type, the binge eating type. Now you can have binge eating type of anorexia. Partial full remission, the BMI mild is greater than 17, moderate is 16, severe is 15 or less. 
you ever had one of those little scales where you can get your BMI off it? I tell you what, I don't get near 16. Suicide rate, 1.2%. In DSM-4, if a, a lady had to lose her period, that's no longer required in DSM-5, but you can lose so much weight that ladies no longer have their periods. Onset between 14 and 18 years of age, fear of losing weight, preoccupation with food, perceive themselves as unattractive, must be perfect in every way, mildly depressed and low self-image, indecisive, weak concentration, disturbed sleep, obsessive compulsiveness, compulsive cycle sort of like an addiction. It goes sort of like this. They have a fear of being overweight. That's fueled by their body distortion. They see their body is too heavy, even though it's not. Leads to starvation, which leads to anxiety, which leads to depression, which leads to obsessive rigidity which leads to medical dysfunction, which leads to a greater fear of losing control. So they resolve to be thinner, to be more in control. And we get in this loop and we keep going around and around and around until either the person gets help or the person might actually die of lack of food and lack of nutrition. As a counselor, you may have to hospitalize that person and have them force fed to just save their life. Precipitating factors is a combination. 50% of families emphasize thinness and physical appearance and dieting. Codependent emesh families, cultural pressure to be thin. Families identify the child's needs for them. Respond excessively to opinions. Set point compensation. That means your body, when it's at a certain level for a while, wants to stay at that level no matter what that level is. Low depression and low serotonin level. Treatment. The best thing I can say about this, except that it's very difficult, is you need a group of different people. You need doctors, you need nurses, you need counselors, you need all these people working in the same way, trying to restore the weight and trying to help them see things differently. And so it takes a lot of work to try and deal with these particular things. Antidepressants are good after weight gain has started. They're not very useful until you get some of the weight gain coming back in the particular person. Bulimia nervosa. How is that different? Well, the way it is different is that the person is maintaining body weight, but they're eating a lot and then they're purging. They don't have body distortion view like you do in anorexia, and they have normal body weight. Clients like this are going to do what? They're going to eat very little, or they're going to eat just specific things, and then they might binge and eat so much, and then they don't want to get the calories, so they try to get rid of them. Of course, one of the problems is it doesn't really work. And after you've already eaten the food and then you throw it up, you already got most of the minerals already. The problem also can be exercise. They can just exercise and exercise. Basically, they're going to keep this body weight, and it's a regular body weight that they're keeping, but they're eating a lot, and then they're doing things to try and get rid of the calories. And it puts them on a cycle, and it can be just as dangerous as anorexia. One particular client, I wasn't one of mine, but she was in the hospital just for a check-in and fell over and her heart stopped. And they were able to save her because she was standing there in the hospital. But she had lost so much nutrition and so on by the purging that was going on that it actually affected her heart and her heart stopped. So this can be very detrimental as well as anorexia. Infrequent binge eating characterized by both eating in less than two hours more food than the average individual would, we call that binging, a sense of lack of control over eating during the episode, that they feel out of control. If they're just a person that wants to eat and get fat, does this fit here? No. There are people who are going to be struggling with that and we'll have another diagnosis here in a little bit.
recurrent inappropriate compensatory behavior to prevent weight gain, such as vomiting, laxatives, diuretics, medications, fasting, and excessive exercise. Dieting would also fit into this particular situation. How many people do we know that tend to overeat and then diet? I think there's probably a lot of ladies that fit into that category, but they wouldn't fit into this if they're not binging, do you see what I'm saying? And then doing something about the binging. See, you're binging and then you're reacting immediately to that to do something so you don't get so many calories from what you just ate. And I guess you think about this as sort of have your cake and eat it too. You know, have your cake and not get fat. But it's worse than that. This again, we're dealing with control issues here. Now, the control issues here are not as great as they are in anorexia. Anorexia is just iron-clad control. At least once a week for three months. Self-evaluation is unduly influenced by body weight and so on. But they don't have a wrong evaluation to how heavy they are. They're keeping the right weight. Not exclusively during anorexia nervosa. If it is, you would give the anorexia diagnosis. Specifiers, partial or full remission, mild three times a week, moderate four to seven times a week, severe eight to 13 times a week. Can you see somebody binging and purging eight to 13 times a week? Other characteristics, the binge is trigger initially an upsetting event, depression, hunger, concerns for weight or shape, or indulge in forbidden foods. So it's a psychological thing that gets going here. Binge begins with feelings of unbearable tension. They're resisting, they're resisting in the flesh, they're resisting, and tension just builds and builds and they have to eat. And they have to binge and they lose control. They feel powerless. Followed by guilt, reproach, and fear. Then they try to compensate with binging. Vomiting only stops about two-thirds of the nutrients that you get from the food. So the other one-third you get. Laxatives don't act until the calories are absorbed. So this stuff doesn't work. Increasingly depressed, ashamed, and guilty. They have problems identifying when they're hungry, when they're full. They get fatigue, anxiety, anger. They recognize the behavior as pathological. They're people pleasers. They may be interested in sexual activity and being attractive. Low family support, social skills inadequate, conflicted, unsatisfactory social lives. They have fewer obsessive qualities, long history of mood swings, easily frustrated. One third have personality disorders. Now, what's this like? We're going to go back and think about it a bit here. When we talk about anorexia and we're talking about bulimia, what are you picking up here with the guilt and the other things? See, this is very much like other addictions, isn't it? So sometimes you treat these things as an addiction, just like a drug alcohol addiction or anything else, as an eating addiction. Sometimes they're called eating addictions because you get that whole cycle going of you're doing something, short-term gain, Long-term loss, you know, yeah, it makes me feel good when I have all that sugar from all that binging that I'm doing. But long-term, how do I feel about myself? But because I feel bad about myself, what do I need to do? Do you see, it's the same kind of a cycle that we have, and there's that drivenness of when you try to stop that you want to do it. So one of the ways of treating this kind of thing, multidisciplinary is the best way to treat this, but another way is basically 12 steps, like you do for drug and alcohol and other things like that. Engage the client and the family if you can get involved in this. You've got to take care, especially in anorexia, you've got to take care of that eating and make sure they're not going to starve to death in your watch. And you might have to get them to go to their doctor and get their doctor to put them in the hospital and force feed them. But you're going to have to deal with the underlying issues just like we do in addictions. It's a multifaceted thing that we're dealing with here. Now, new for DSM-5, 
and hasn't been there before is binge eating disorder. So you don't have to have the purging. You can have just binge eating. Infrequent binge eating characterized by both eating in less than two hours more food than average individual would. That's just like in bulimia. A sense of a lack of control over eating during the episode. Binge eating episodes are associated with three or more of the following. Eating faster than normal. Eating until feeling uncomfortably full. Eating large amounts of food when not feeling hungry. Eating alone because of embarrassment of how much they're eating. Disgusted by themselves, depressed or very guilty afterward. Mark distress regarding binge eating at least once a week for three months, not bulimia or anorexia, specifiers, partial, full remission, mild, moderate, extreme, severe. There's a better outcome for binge eating disorders than there is for anorexia or bulimia. And the question is, what is the function? What usually is the function? Usually has to do with depression or other issues like that. So what do you think you might do in treatment? Antidepressant. See if you can get them out of depression. See if they can feel good about themselves. And of course, help them understand that God loves them and accepts them just the way they are. You have to deal with this just like, again, addictions that we talk about. Other specified feeding or eating disorders. There are many specifiers. Atypical anorexia nervosa. Bulimia nervosa of low frequency or mild duration. Binge eating disorder of low frequency or limited duration. Purging disorder without binging. Night eating syndrome. Unspecified feeding or eating disorders. The next category, and these are all, remember, somatics, so we're all talking about physical things. Elimination disorders. And you might not think you see any of these, but I actually had a girl that had one of these elimination disorders that we were trying to deal with and figure out for the school. The first one is in rhesus, which is basically that they're wetting their bed. How many kids do you think wet their beds? Yes, but of course the deal here is it's 7% boys, 3% girls, over five. They have to be over age five for this diagnosis. Repeated voiding of urine in the bed or clothes whether voluntary or intentional, at least two times a week for three months, or clinical distress or impairment. Development age of at least five years. Not a substance, medication, or medical condition. Specifiers, nocturnal only. Diurnal, that means day only. Nocturnal and diurnal. The primary type means they've never established continence. They never got to the place that they could maintain themselves. And secondary type means they had established and they regressed. Remission, 5 to 10 percent per year. Only 1 percent go into adulthood. What do you think the classical ways of doing this? It's all behavior modification, right? Like you can get a bell that you put in the bed so when the bed gets wet this bell rings and wakes them up. There are other types of this, a drug, imipirin, that will also help. And then there is encopresis. This is when they are defecating. In this particular case that I'm talking about is that the little girl was leaving her defecations around the school. I got another girl to do it. And so you look at that and you say, now what is going on here? Well, again, you have to figure out what the different issues are. A repeated passage of feces in inappropriate places, clothing or the floor, whether voluntary or intentional. So this diagnosis is for both. At least once a month for three months, chronological and development age of four years, not due to a substance such as a laxative or a medical condition, Specifiers with or without constipation or overflow in consonants. What are the possibilities? Oppositional defiant or conduct disorders. It could be on purpose. But many times it's not. Inner conflict, disturbed family, poor toilet training, other issues. What's your job as a counselor? 
Got to figure out what's going on with this particular kid and why this is happening. And then what are you probably going to use? Behavior modification. You're going to give rewards, maybe stars, if you go so long without doing it, or consequences if you do. You've got to go clean it up. I think that's a fairly good consequence. Other specified elimination disorders or unspecified elimination disorders. Now, another one that gets very interesting is sleep-wake disorders. So these are all these physical things that can have psychological components that we're talking about today. The first one are called dysomias. You need to remember this, okay? A dysomia means what? A dysomia means you sleep too much or too little. We're going to get parasomias in a little bit, and those are the ones that are the night terrors and the sleepwalking and the other kind of things like that. As a counselor, are you going to get any of these? Yeah, you can. I've had restless leg syndrome before. I've had different people that can't sleep. I've had different people that have night terrors, all these kind of things, sleepwalkers. Insomnia disorder, that means there's too little sleep. Dissatisfaction with sleep quality or quantity with at least one. Difficulty initiating sleep, difficulty maintaining sleep, early morning awakening and inability to return to sleep. Clinically significant distress or impairment. Three nights a week for three months when the person has an opportunity to sleep. Not another sleep-wake disorder, substance, medication, or medical disorder. Specifiers. With no sleep disorder, mental comorbidity, other medical comorbidity, means there are other problems that are involved in here, with the sleep disorder. Episodes one to three months, persistent for three months or longer, reoccurring episodes for one year. Factors, biological, psychological, lifestyle, trying to sleep, substance abuse. Hypersomia disorder. That means they're sleeping too much. So we're on the other end of this thing. Self-reported excessive sleep. Recurrent periods of sleep and falls into sleep. Prolonged main sleep episode for more than nine hours. That's non-restorative. Difficulty being awake after an abrupt sleep. Occurs at least three times a week for three months. Significant distress and impairment. And we have a bunch of specifiers again, just like the rest. How many of you heard of narcolepsy? What's narcolepsy? The person just falls over, falls asleep type of thing. And the good thing is they've really found out why this happens now, and so it's not such a mystery because it is a hypocretin deficiency that happens in the person. And there are two types of that. One is the type where the person starts laughing or something and their muscles just go flabby and they just collapse. Another type, it doesn't, they don't have to even be laughing. They just basically collapse and fall asleep right in their chair, right where they are, right where they're going. And it turns out that this, again, is more of a medical type of thing that we're talking about here. Hypersolemness disorder. Self-reported excessive sleep in at least one of the following. Reoccurrent periods of sleep that lasts into the day. Prolonged sleep episodes for nine hours. Difficulty when they awake abruptly. We have all sorts of other ones here that we're probably not going to have time to get into because we have some other things that we do need to cover. Obstructive sleep apnea. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that. That means when the person actually stops breathing. And then we have central sleep apnea. That's when the person has a hard time breathing. In all of these, they run tests to see what's going on with the person. And sleep-related hyperventilation. And then circadian rhythm sleep. How many of you have ever had jet lag? Well, if you have a really difficult time with that, that also could be a mental disorder here. And then the parasomias. Rapid eye movement sleep arousal disorder. Nightmare disorder. Rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder. Restless leg syndrome. Substance abuse sleep disorder. Other specified sleep-wake disorders. So we have all of those. But we have some others we need to cover here today. And those are the disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. 
And these you're going to find you're going to be dealing a lot more with than some of the other ones. The other ones many times are dealt with doctors. These are ones that you're going to be dealing with. How many of you have heard of oppositional defiant disorder? Angry, irritable mood, argumentative, defiant behavior, or vindictiveness for at least six months as evidenced by at least four symptoms from any of the following categories and exhibited during interaction with at least one individual that is not a sibling. So this has to be with adults and authority figures. Angry or irritable, losing temper, being touchy or easily annoyed by others, being angry or resentful, argumentative, defiant behavior, arguing with adults or authority figures, actively defying or refusing to carry out the rules or requests of adults, deliberately doing things that annoy others, blaming others for their own mistakes and behavior, and vindictiveness being spiteful and vindictive. Clinically significant distress in the child or others. Isn't that interesting? Younger than five years old, it has to happen most days, five or older, at least once per week for six months. A mild, moderate, severe. So what's the main thing about oppositional defiant disorder? You tell them to do something and they won't do it, right? That's going to be different than some of the other ones we're looking at. I'm going to jump ahead and go to conduct disorder because I want to compare it. And then we'll come back to intermittent explosive disorder. Conduct disorder, 2 to 10 percent, an average of 4 percent of the population. Repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior violating basic rights of others, norms and rules for 12 months or more, including aggressive against people, bullying, starts fights, uses a weapon that could cause serious injury, physical cruelty to people, physical cruelty to animals, theft with confrontation, forced sex upon someone, property destruction, deliberately sets fires, deliberately destroys property, theft or lying, broken into buildings, house or car, frequently lying and breaks promises, stolen valuables, burglary, forgery, shoplifting, Serious violation of rules before age 13, stays out all night against parents' wishes, runs away twice before age 13, truancy. Symptoms clinically report and over 18 do not have antisocial personality disorder. Normally that's what this is going to be when you get to age 18. Specifiers, childhood, adult, or unspecified onset, limited prosocial emotions, Lack of remorse or guilt, callous, lack of empathy, unconcerned about performance, shallow or deficient effect, mild, moderate, or severe. Interesting thing, people with this they found have a lower resting heart rate and some brain regularity differences. But what is the difference of this one now versus oppositional defiant? See, opposite defiant, they're fighting the adults, okay? But in this one, they're just going out and doing everything. They sort of have no boundaries whatsoever, and they run over everybody, and it's not because somebody told them not to do it. They're not fighting the authority. They're just having no boundaries, and they're doing all sorts of things. Okay? Then we have intermittent explosive disorder. It's very difficult because this is the only diagnosis that you have for people who have anger problems. And a lot of people don't meet this particular diagnosis, so you're going to get thrown into the nonspecific impulse disorders and so on. Reoccurrent behavioral outbursts representing a failure to control aggressive impulses as manifested by either of the following. Now I want you to listen to this because it's sort of different than what has been in the past. Verbal aggression, temper tantrums, tirades, verbal arguments or fights, or physically aggressive toward animals or other individuals occurring twice weekly on an average for three months, not resulting in the destruction of property or physical injury. 
So you could give this and it wouldn't have to be that they destroyed anything or they did anything or injured anybody. They just have tirades and scream and yell and do all those kind of things. Or three behavioral outbursts involving damage or destruction of property or the physical assault involving physical injury against animals or people within a 12-month period. So you have three domestic violence charges within a five-month period, this could apply. Or if they've done three things, they've punched holes in walls, that would be considered injury to property, wouldn't it? Or they've hurt people or thrown things or other things like that. So either one of those can qualify for intermittent explosive disorder. The magnitude of the aggression is grossly out of proportion to the provocation or the precipitating psychosocial stressors. Now, if you throw something at someone who's trying to kill you, that doesn't fit this. Okay, it's when the provocation is this level and you're reacting this level. Aggressive outbursts are not premeditated. That's also important. This person isn't thinking. They're just not. That would be conduct disorder, wouldn't it? Or antisocial personality disorder. And are not committed to achieve some tangible object like money, power, or intimidation. Again, that would be antisocial personality disorder. At least age six or equivalent development. Not another mental disorder including adjustment disorder, personality disorder, or medical condition. This is sort of the classical domestic violence type of thing. So how are we going to treat that? We'll look at the characteristics and help them get a hold of how to use their anger appropriately and try and find out what the underlying cause, what's usually the underlying cause. Insecurity, fear of abandonment, they just see everything as huge beyond imagination. Got some other ones we need to look at before we close here today. Pyromania. How is pyromania different from some kid that's just playing with matches? They're intentionally setting the fires and they get a kick out of it. Deliberate and purposeful fire setting on more than one occasion. Tension and effective arousal before the act. If you don't have the tension and the effective arousal, they're not getting something out of it, you don't have pyromania. Fascination with interest in curiosity about or attraction to fire and its situational context. Pleasure, gratification, or relief when setting fires and when witnessing or participating in the aftermath. Not done for monetary gain, social political ideology, conceal a criminal activity, anger or vengeance, improving life circumstances, impaired judgment, or mental disorder or substance. It's not a conduct disorder, manic episode, or antisocial personality disorder. Then we have kleptomania. You probably see some people that have kleptomania. This is 4 to 24% of all shoplifters have this problem called kleptomania. They steal unneeded objects. I remember in the news of this movie star who had millions that was stealing things that she didn't even need. Reoccurrent failure to resist impulses to steal objects that are not needed or for personal use or value. Increased sense of tension immediately after the theft. Pleasure, gratification, or relief at the time of the theft. Again, it's that tension thing. There was this one kid that I was working with, and he was working in a store, which probably wasn't a very good place for him to be. But when this tension would build and build and build, and then he would take something and sneak it out of the store. See, do you see there's an adrenaline thing going on here? There are other things that are going on. It isn't that this person is poor and they're stealing things. Not to express anger or vengeance and not delusional hallucination, not conduct disorder, manic episode, or antisocial personality disorder. Other specified disruptive impulse and control disorders. These are other ones where you can put people in these other categories if they don't fit. Unspecified disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. Treatment. 
Nothing's really been proven one way or another, but usually behavior modification, trying to find out what is the function of what they're doing and maybe what happened to them. What, why do they get a thrill out of it or why are they fighting this particular thing? Spec. When we talk about all these things we talked about today, which ones fit into which categories? How much of this is spiritual? We really don't know because a lot of cases peers could take advantage of these particular types of problems and exasperate them. Uh, physical. A lot of these have very physical things that are underlying them and you're going to have to eliminate the physical things before you can get at the psychological ones. Experiences especially in the conduct disorder and the oppositional defiant disorder and the intermittent explosive disorder, it's the experiences that probably cause the underlying issues that are underneath those things. See, why is a kid defiant against adults? Usually because they've been neglected and they see the adults as being against them and not having their best interest in mind. So they're going to say, I got to take care of myself. So they're going to fight everything everyone tells them to do. And choices. There are choices in all these things, at least at the beginning. Sometimes a lot of them, the impulse control stuff gets carried away to the point that they just don't seem to be able to resist the things in the flesh. But again, all of these from a Christian counseling point of view, get them saved, help them to understand that God loves them, change their whole perception of life, their whole world view. And it's going to greatly affect these things and help these situations. Let's pray. Lord God, we need your help. We realize that these things are so confusing and that many times there are all these different factors that are involved and we don't have a clue, but you know. And so we're asking you to guide our counseling, to help us, to lead us, that we might be effective of helping people struggling with all of these issues. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, cause Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other.